Hi there, and welcome to this tutorial on GCSE Biology for the AQA specification, focusing on the topic of communicable diseases, and in particular on the discovery and development of drugs. I'm Shumana from StudyMind, where we help you revise GCSE Biology with our helpful video tutorials, tailored to your subject, your specification, and to you. If you're new here, make sure you click the subscribe button. Whilst you are watching, please leave any comments below if you're unsure about anything and let us know if it's your first time watching our videos so we can send you our free revision materials. We also have helpful timestamps below for each part of the video to help guide you through the specification. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to tutorial 9 of 9 in which we'll be looking at the discovery and development of drugs. So in our previous tutorial, we took a look at antibiotics and painkillers, we explored how they worked, and also had a look into antibiotic resistance. And this is something that's going to come up in this tutorial as well. So please do go back and recap at least that little bit on antibiotic resistance in the last tutorial, because I think that will really help with you understanding the need, the, or the desperate need to produce more efficient drugs that we can use in clinical practice. So these are our key learning objectives for today and we're going to start off by looking at why we may actually need to discover new drugs. So there's various reasons why drug discovery is so so important in these modern days. So first of all we may need to find treatments for known diseases which have no cure. So HIV is a really good example of this, as this is a, a, a disease that ends up killing the patient eventually, but there still exists no cure, even though lots is known about the pathogenesis and how the disease process works. In addition, as I said earlier, antibacterial resistance has become a really, sorry, antibiotic resistance has become a really, really big problem, um, as the more that we've used antibiotics, the more that these resistant strains of bacteria have emerged in their populations. So finding substitute treatments that are effective to replace current ineffective ones is a really, really important aspect that we are trying to cover. Also, finding better treatments to replace current ones is something that's been facilitated by improvements in technology over recent years. And lastly, drug discovery can be used in finding treatments for new diseases that emerge over time. So research is constantly being done to discover new drugs or find better treatments. And this is particularly important as antibiotic resistance grows, as I mentioned earlier. And historically, most drugs have been extracted from plants and microorganisms, examples of which we'll be looking at later on in this tutorial. But in modern times, actually many drugs are synth synthesised by chemists themselves. So just to recap, drug discovery is really important in finding treatments for new diseases, for known diseases with no cure, such as HIV, to find substitute treatments to replace current ones, and to find better treatments to replace current ones. So now let's move on to look at a few examples of drugs. So digitalis is extracted from foxglove plant leaves. And so digoxine itself is extracted from the plant and it's used as a drug to stimulate heart muscle and increase heart rate. So this is an example of a drug that can be extracted from a plant. In a similar way, aspirin is derived from willow tree bark. And the actual active component in, sal in aspirin is salicylic acid, I gave it away a bit there. And this is found in the tree bark itself and, it's, and it forms the main ingredient in aspirin. And aspirin is used to reduce pain and, and inflammation. So here we've seen two different types of drugs, digoxin and aspirin, each extracted from plants and each used for differing purposes and both very important and very big in the pharmacological industry. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the story of penicillin, which was actually discovered by accident by Alexander Fleming. 
So Fleming actually went on holiday and he was notoriously known for not being the most hygienic scientist. And so he goes on holiday, he leaves a few petri dishes which contain colonies of Staphylococcus, which is a bacteria that causes boils, sore throats and abscesses. So he's left these petri dishes containing all of the Staphylococcus on his work surface and he's left a window open in his lab. And when he comes back, he notices something rather unusual on one dish. So it was dotted with colonies, apart from an area where a blob of mould was growing. And around this blob of mould was a clear kind of lysed, so, you know, lysed area. So what I mean by that is, an, is, a, is a clear area in the gel within which the cells around, the bacterial cells around, had been destroyed. So, you know, as you can see in this diagram here, you have these areas where there are no bacteria, these clear areas. So he notices this, and this, this, this was found immediately around the mould itself. And actually this mould was later identified as a strain of penicillium. But Fleming didn't know that at the time. But to him it appeared as if the mould had secreted something that inhibited bacterial growth. And he later found that his mould juice was capable of killing a wide range of harmful bacteria. And this came to be known as penicillin. So it's all very good finding these drugs, but after a drug is discovered, it must be developed and trialled in order to ensure that it's effective in treating disease and also safe to use. And the use of a drug depends on three aspects, dosage, toxicity and efficacy. So first of all, let's look at dosage. So it's crucial to work out the optimum dosage for a drug. Too low a dose will mean that the drug is ineffective, and too high a dose could mean that the drug is, could, could lead to dangerous side effects and toxicity. So we need some kind of in-between where we're going to get the effects of the drug without overdoing the effects and causing toxicity to the body, but also enough of the drug so that it's actually effective. So think of it as like a balancing seesaw or a balancing pair of weighing scales. So the second important thing in drug testing is testing for toxicity. So as I said earlier, too much of a drug may cause toxicity, but also just the drug in general may be toxic to the human body. So it's important to check for toxic side effects of the drug. So some drugs might lead to mutations in cells and increase the risk of cancer. So we need to check for both short and long-term side effects. So not only side effects that present five minutes after the drug is taken, for example, but also long-term side effects, which might manifest after years, tens of years. And lastly, we've also got to take into consideration the efficacy of the drug. So this means how effective the drug is against the disease. It needs to have a significant benefit in treating patients before it can be approved. So for example, a drug that only kills very few of, well, a smaller proportion of the bacterial population is said to have poor efficacy. But the higher its killing capacity, the higher the efficacy of the drug. So now let's move on to look at clinical trials. So in general, there are five stages to clinical trials and we'll be having a look at them um, now. So just to recap, clinical trials are research studies used to investigate scientific theories. So many drugs don't actually get approved for national use and it takes years and years and billions of pounds until a drug is actually approved. And these clinical trials are very, very costly and very, very in-depth, so it's not an easy process to develop a drug. So as I said, there are five general stages to clinical trials, so we'll go through each of them now. So first of all, we have preclinical testing, which is testing that's done within the lab. And this testing does not involve humans, it doesn't involve animals. It starts off with computer modelling and also testing in vitro. Sorry, that's meant to say in vitro, ignore in vivo. So, as I said, we're not testing on animals, we're not testing on humans, we're testing in vitro and in computer models. So by in vitro, I mean outside of the body, so in a test tube. 
So this stage aims to make sure that the drug is safe and effective before subsequently in introducing it into animals or humans. So once testing within computer models and in vitro, um, once the, all of that shows safety of the drug, the drug is then tested on animals. But of course, animal testing also poses ethical problems, and so this can cause quite an uproar amongst people who feel very strongly against animal testing, but yet it is still necessary in the UK before the introduction of any drug. And after passing the animal test testing stage, only then are drugs tested on human healthy volunteers. And just remember that at any of these stages, if the drug is found to be ineffective or not safe, that the clinical trial is immediately stopped. And hardly, well, a very small percentage of drugs actually make it to the end of the whole trial, the end of all the five steps in the trial. So step number, th step number three is phase one of clinical testing. And this is using very, very, very low doses of the drug on humans. And this stage checks that the treatment is safe and finds the best dose to use. And in order to you know, maximise safety, we're going to use the smallest number of patients possible, so around 15 to 20 volunteers maybe. And we're just trying to make sure that the treatment is safe. And we're also working up slowly the concentrations of the drug that we're giving the human in order to find the right dose. So we're titrating to the right kind of dose that we want to be using in a clinical setting. Then we move on to phase two, which involves testing how well the drug works in actually treating patients, so the efficacy. So this is a larger test involving more participants, so around 20 to 150 participants. And finally, phase three, which involves comparison of the drug to the current treatment in a large trial. So this can involve around 100 or thousands of participants. The more, the better, because the more reliable the results will be, because we're using a larger proportion of the population. And we're comparing this to existing treatments, because we don't want to waste all this money and time developing a drug if it's going to be as efficient or less efficient as drugs that are already on the market. So we want to go for something that's better than what's already out there. And these trials are often double blind. So it means that we use a placebo in the trial. So basically a um, some form of um, substance that is taken by the patient that doesn't contain any active drug ingredients, but is the same across all other aspects. So it might be the same dose, it might look the same, it might taste the same, etc. So there's no way of the patient to know whether they're taking a placebo or the medication. And I say this trial is double blind because the patient doesn't know whether they're being given a placebo, but also the scientist themselves doesn't know whether they're giving the patient a placebo or not. And this just has the effect of reducing bias within the experiment and therefore increases the reliability of the trial. So this tutorial went through everything step by step, so perhaps it's a good idea to kind of go through within your revision notes and create a step one, a step two, a step three, and so on, especially for the clinical trial section, because this is a really common thing for AQA to test you on. So well done for today, that's everything covered and I will see you for the next session. Thanks for watching this free video from Study Mind. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe to catch our newest videos by clicking below and leave a comment on a topic you'd like a video on. Click here to watch more videos in our series for GCSE Biology or visit our website studymind.co.uk for free past paper compilations by topic and specification.